So welcome to our 11th public lecture in the focal topic Justice in Sustainability. My name is Bernardo Jurema, and I'm part of the coordination team uh, of the Justice Focal Topic at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. I'm also a research associate at the project Democratic Governance for Eco-Political Transformations. Uh, so cars are so ubiquitous in our world today that we rarely stop to question its centrality. Cities are clogged with traffic jams, the streets overtaken by car. The auto industry is a crucial employer, especially here in Germany. Um, the electric car is touted as the key for a green transition. In the US, we just had the uh, um, um, railroad uh, workers um, situation. So it's um, as we seek to shed light on the importance of justice and sustainability and all the complex interactions between sustainability transformations and questions of justice, it is imperative that we think about questions of mobility. And so we are privileged to have today Dr. Mimi Scheller to help us uh, think through this crucial issue. My colleague, um, Anka uh, Clever, uh, will introduce our guest and lay out the connection between our lecture series and the issue of mobility. In other words, why is mobility a key issue in justice in sustainability debates? But before Anka jumps in, I want to say a few words on behalf of the Justice in Sustainability team. This public lecture series is one of the activities carried out in the context of the IASS 2022-2023 focal topic. The public lecture series features different well-established and rising scholars and practitioners in the fields of justice and sustainability. Our aim is to put highly relevant work on different justice dimensions in climate and sustainability politics up for debate, addressing an academic audience as well as the general public. Uh, the dates for our upcoming lectures and other activities can be found on our website. Please check out, check out our website, subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter if you want to learn more about our activities. I will link them uh, on the chat. Um, to introduce today's topic uh, and our guest, I pass the word now to Anka Kleva, research associate and PhD student in the transport transition as a social ecological real world experiment, Xperi project. Anka. Yeah. Thank you, Bernardo. Hello also from my side. Uh, nice that you all joined online. Um, yeah, and before we jump into the concrete uh, content of climate mobility justice, uh, the topic of today's lecture, I will briefly introduce Mimi Scheller to you. Um, she is a inaugural dean of the Global School at Wüster Polytech Institute in Massachusetts, and I hope now I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> um, yeah, and from 2010 up to 2021, she was a professor of sociology, head of the sociology department, and funding director of the Center for Mobilities Research and Policy at Drexel University in Philadelphia. She also served as a president of the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic and Mobility, and as a funding co-director of the Centers for Mobilities Research at Lanchester University, funding co-editor of the Journal of Mobility, which is also yeah, quite common in the German context, and, um, yeah, and associate editor of the Transverse Journal. She helped to establish the new mobility paradigm and the field of critical mobility studies. Um, she has also contributed to the field of Caribbean studies through work on uh, peasant movements, gender and racial equity, disaster recovery, and ecological movements in Jamaica and Haiti. And currently, she is a co-investor on a new project on building community climate action networks in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
And yeah, for several reasons, the Institute and I are very delighted to welcome Shella on stage today because she has mainly shaped the mobility justice concept and mobility justice, I directly quote Shella, is a concept describing uneven access to the right to movement as well as the right to remain or dwell and the infrastructures for mobility, communication and dwelling. It focuses on the differential capabilities and unequal experiences of groups in relation to how, when and where they can and cannot move and of quotation and with this concept she on the one hand links the yeah the crisis of climate change unsustainable forms of urbanization and migration to mobility and on the other hand also focus on justice rather than on equity and this concept and perspective brings a new topic, um, namely mobility, into our justice and sustainability lecture series. And I think this new topic of mobility uh, quite smoothly fits into our previous lectures um, in which we have touched upon the effectiveness and the perspectives of the Global South on the climate crisis, colonialism, neocolonialism, which underlines the current green growth approaches to sustainability. And yeah, further, what I find particular interesting and fruitful of your perspective uh, for the discourse in Germany is that the concept moves across different spatial and temporal scales. And in this way, I think the concept integrates and links the mobility transition in and to existing societal structures and also to other transformation processes we are confronted with in our society. And the mobility justice concept is not solely as often approached in the German context about the distribution of um, cost and benefits of the transport sector, but also about deliberative, procedural, restorative and epistemic justice. And um, yeah, in addition, Shella is, as I said in the introduction, one among a handful of mobility scholars who critically question mobility. And uh, yeah, for Mimi Shella, the um, yeah, observing the current reality of mobility, the crisis of capitalism also comes to the fore, namely the destruction of social structures, in particular those pertaining to care work and the integrity of the natural environment on which capitalism itself depends. And in this sense, mobility can also function as a mirror of society and is at the same time also a place where change towards a radically different future can be initiated. And there was, in my personal perspective, I think Shella really well repoliticizes our view of mobility um, because there are no technocratic neutral solutions to, or mobility solutions and the reproduction of unjust infrastructures can only be avoided by becoming conscious about the specificities of the unjust crisis ridden status quo. And uh, yeah, this critical perspective on mobility and also the holistic mobility justice approach yeah, shapes also my scientific work. And uh, yeah, I don't want to take much more of your time, Michela, and I would yeah, like to give the digital word to yours and I'm excited for the talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, Anka, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Bernardo, for hosting me. Thank you to the IASS um, for this wonderful series of talks that you have curated here. And I'm really delighted to be part of the series. Um, I think your introductory remarks, Anka, were perfect for setting up what I wanna talk about today because I'm going to take a very broad perspective on um, thinking about mobility justice in relation to the questions you mentioned about sort of um, uh, restorative justice and the idea of reparations and this sort of the the notion of a climate debt that might be owed by the global north. Um, excuse me for my hoarse voice. I do have a sore throat today, but hopefully um, <clears throat> I'll still be able to speak okay. So I'm going to share my screen, and I have some slides here. Just get presenter mode. Okay, so I'll be speaking today about the idea of climate mobility justice. It's a particular way of putting these three terms together and relating that to the ideas of reparations, kinopolitics and mobile commoning. And my talk will include three parts, climate mobility justice and climate reparations, 
then I'll discuss really ways to think about how we can move forward from the critique, right, from the critical perspective to what comes next. And this is where I'm really pushing to develop some new ideas that relate to decolonial and in critical indigenous perspectives, as well as Caribbean theorists, which really seek to think about mobile commoning and unsettling mobility as a sort of different way of thinking about where we're headed or where we need to head. And then I'll lead to a, just a conclusion um, beyond climate colonialism. So just to contextualize before I begin, I just wanted to draw attention to the sort of context in which we are living and the really appalling and sort of difficult um, confrontations that have been taking place on borders around the world. And here I'm giving examples from one incident that happened um, over a year ago, it was September, 2021, when um, a large group of 14,000 people, mainly from Haiti, had moved from Latin America where they had been for more, uh, more than a decade since the earthquake that happened in 2010 in Haiti, they had been able to move to these other countries to work in the economies there as temporary labor forces. And then during the pandemic, those economies shut down and those people were pushed out and they headed ac north across Latin America, across Central America and up towards the US-Mexico border. They crossed the Rio Grande River and were met there by US border agents who stopped them at Del Rio, Texas. And there were these, these scenes, these sort of horrible scenes of um, white border guards on horseback kind of rounding up people and parents with children crossing the river. And then all of these people camped out under a highway overpass. And, and the scene of the highway overpass is like uh, this juxtaposition of US transportation infrastructure, right? The, the mobility of the highway and the highway system and all that it represents and the greenhouse gas that that is contributing to the atmosphere because of our highways and our automobile dependence. And then that links back to the crisis in Latin America, the economic forces, the climate change forces that have driven people, especially out of Central America, to move north towards the US border. And after this event, the Biden administration deported thousands of these people back to Haiti during a political crisis uh, right before and after the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. And so I thought this was exemplary of how US policy has created this um, spectacle of racialized exclusion. And it's much of it is in violation of international humanitarian law and the ability of people to make asylum cases, for example. And although it's not specifically a climate change driven migration, it feeds into the larger narrative about climate um, driving migration around the world, climate disruptions. And so I just wanted to set that as the context and talk now in the first part about how we need to reframe this and think about these kinds of narratives differently in relation to a climate mobility justice perspective and climate reparations and, and why these are so um, urgent for us to, to recognize today. So the pandemic mobility disruption had massive economic and social dislocations, which demobilized some people and some uh, you know, movements in the world, but it also remobilized people and, and practices in the world in unexpected ways. And in that sort of joint demobilization and remobilization, the pandemic exposed many issues of mobility and justice. In the larger literature on mobility justice, um, th other uh, Thinkers like Verlingeri and Schwannin have called for fully recognizing the ways in which the mobilities of different individuals and groups are bound to those of others and to the non-human environment in complex, multi-scalar and situated ways. And that reflects exactly on what I have tried to do with my concept of mobility justice is to link 
across scales, to link across these different situated human and non-human environments. And again, why that is so urgent is because we see this wall building, this bordering, and also the denationalization of many undo undocumented populations around the world who are actually left stateless, along with the refusal of refugees, which leaves people relegated to death zones. And by that, I mean the sinking of boats we've seen you know, on the borders of Europe, right in the Mediterranean, now recently in the English Channel, and the sense in which there's a real crisis at our borders. And the mobility justice concept is a way to really rehumanize our relations, our kinopolitical relations to each other. Kinopolitical meaning the politics of movement and also the movement of politics. So in my book, Mobility Justice, I write about how power and inequality inform all kinds of governance and control of movement, all different kinds of movement, and that that shapes patterns of unequal mobilities and immobilities. And that we see that kind of take form as dominant mobility regimes. And it is those mobility regimes, which are the ways of governing mobilities from this bodily scale to urban streets and, and infrastructures to borders and transnational mobilities. It's those dominant forms of governance that produce differential and uneven access to mobility space and to movement. And behind that, the control of immobility and mobility is a kind of power that I argue has deep historical roots in patriarchy, colonialism, imperialism, and racial capitalism. These differential mobilities have been scripted into our spatial relations and practices over hundreds of years. And it's that form that we live in, which in turn has shaped climate mobilities, meaning it has shaped the climate crisis and climate disruption that we are living through and the ecological um, crisis. So mobility justice is a way to frame these entanglements of power and social exclusion, not only in the mobilities of people, but also of things, of information, and the complex um, unequal relations to movement and capabilities to move that are experienced across diverse mobilities. And just to turn to um, carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions briefly, and greenhouse gases, there's many different ways of visualizing differential carbon emissions, but most of them, and I give a few different examples here of ways in which we rank um, who has contributed most to global CO2 emissions. And, you know, on, on the multicolored um, rectangular chart, we see the USA very prominent, then the EU, but also China is included there. Um, when we look at it over time on a timeline on the bottom graph from 1970 to 2010, you'll see China rising the, the red line and the US is the yellow line, the EU is the green line. You can see that there's different um, justification strategies behind some of these graphs where this one might be showing that the EU and the United States are stabilizing their emissions, whereas China's are going up and that feeds into different kinds of arguments on the, on the right-hand bar graph, we see actually Saudi Arabia at the top. These are countries with highest per capita emissions, and then the US, Canada, Australia, South Korea, et cetera. But all in all, whatever the logic is behind these different ways of trying to represent carbon emissions, we know that as UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres put it, that loss and damage funding is the moral responsibility of the rich G20 countries that are responsible for 80% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So this idea of loss and damages has been brought into um, all of the um, COP27 negotiations this year. And we saw a big push, especially from small island developing states, which have been very prominent in these arguments for loss and damages to really get this on the international agenda. And there's the argument for the Caribbean, which is the region which I've worked on for 
25 plus years, that the climate crisis has become also an economic crisis that calls into question the fairness, equality, and justice of socio-political processes on a global scale, as this commentator put it in Forbes magazine in October. And that's why these small island developing states, both in the Caribbean and the Pacific, have been so much at the forefront of pushing for loss and damages to be on the global agenda. But I want to look at this question in, in terms of a broader perspective on climate mobilities. And I'm going to draw here on work by Ingrid Boas and collaborators in um, a special issue of Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, where they helped develop this term of climate mobilities. It, and they argue that the energy intensive mobilities of the privileged contribute to climate change and displacement, and that that's in stark contrast to the limited mobility agency of those most affected by and vulnerable to climate change and displacement. So climate mobilities is a way to think about these complex constellations of various mobilities that are not just one way climate migration. So the term climate migration is built into this framework of fear that the global north or the G20 countries are going to be inundated by climate migrants. Climate mobilities instead reminds us that it's always relational. There are mobilities across different spatial and temporal scales, and this could include immobilities as well as mobilities, that is people who may be stuck in places, unable to leave disrupted ecological systems. There's mobilities of the weather, <clears throat> of water, of plants, of animals, energy flows, digital communication, et cetera. So this multiplicity of climate change related mobilities might involve immobility, relocation, circular mobility, sort of abilities to come and go. And it's not just a wave of one-way climate migration. Instead, we need to appreciate the ongoing patterns and histories of movement and how they're informed by material and political conditions. So to understand the context for climate mobilities, it's crucial to look at the coloniality of climate. And this term has been used by a number of people. Um, anthropologist Yarimar Bonilla talks about the coloniality of disaster um, when she <clears throat> wrote about the hurricanes Irma and Maria in Puerto Rico, saying that vulnerability is not simply a product of natural conditions, it's a political state and a colonial condition. And Farhana Sultana, in her wonderful essay, The Unbearable Heaviness of Climate Coloniality, in political geography argues that decolonizing climate needs to address the complexities of colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, international development, and geopolitics that contribute to the reproduction of ongoing colonialities through existing global governance structures, discursive framings, imagined solutions, and interventions. And so for me, it's been really important in my own work on climate coloniality which I develop in my book, Island Futures, <clears throat> Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene, to look at the ways in which capitalism, colonialism, and slavery kind of set the gradients for contemporary vulnerability to the uneven impacts of climate change. And in this long perspective, we can see that there's an uneven distribution of resources and of the impacts of hydrocarbon pollution, the exposure to climate risks and the local vulnerabilities to disasters that fall most upon the former colonies and peripheries of the world and on the formerly colonized people. And that today, this includes renewable energy transitions. And this is so important that we understand that the techno-modernist solution of just transitioning our economies towards renewable energy will still remain colonial and violent if it imposes the impacts of mining for cobalt, lithium, copper, gold, or rare earth, if it imposes that on the global south or tries to colonize the deep sea or the Arctic or Greenland or the moon 
or build renewable energy projects offshore or on indigenous lands if we don't address the fundamental underlying politics of inequity within those colonial conditions that we live within. So when we look at mining around the world, whether it's cobalt mining in the Congo, the lithium um, on the Atacama Plain in, um, in Chile, bauxite mining in Jamaica uh, or other or Australia, all of these forms of mining are extremely environmentally destructive. And I've written about this in my book, Aluminum Dreams, about the impacts of bauxite mining, for example, but we know that the renewable energy transition is going to require more and more of these metals to make the solar panels and the wind turbines and all of the and the vehicles and all of the things that we hope to transition to a low carbon uh, infrastructure. And so for me, it's crucial that we return to the questions of reparative justice and epistemic justice. And in the second part of my talk, I'm going to turn to this more future oriented, it's both deeply historical and future oriented thinking about mobile commoning and unsettling mobilities. So I've already talked about the, the importance of putting this in the context of the system of transatlantic slavery and plantations and the colonial history of the Caribbean that all of the global mobility patterns that created the Americas, that created the world economy as we saw it emerge in the age of fossil fuels were built on an underside of coerced mobility, involuntary immobility, deportation, detention. Historian Anne Laura Stoller has written about understanding colonies as carceral archipelagos of managed mobilities and immobilities. And she shows the overlap between agricultural colonies, penal colonies, resettlement camps, detention centers, island military bases, and settler communities. And they were all nodes in a global imperial network. So that is the foundation of the current global economy. And mobility within that system is always full of meanings and values and forms of justification that are constituted as a system of kinopolitics. And it's that kinopolitical system that continues to produce violence at our borders, as Reese Jones describes borders, through the dehumanization of some groups of people by others who have benefited from the dominant mobility system. So that leads to um, what Malini Ranganathan and Eve Bratman called an abolitionist climate justice approach. This seeks to address racism and climate induced harm together. They build on W.E.B. Du Bois's notion of abolition democracy, and they seek to bring climate justice demands into conversation with historical reparations and intersectional thinking. So this emphasis on a kind of reparative humanism reminds us that environmental harm often proceeds via dehumanization. And, and in fact, the, and imposes on the non-human world a, a form of violence as well, along with those who are dehumanized, who then become part of that material substrate of um, resources as we think of it, or of um, exploitable labor. So an anti-racist human approach to climate praxis tries to embed narratives of healing from historical trauma. It embraces intersectional thinking and makes unlikely connections between spheres. And here I want to refer to the work of Malcolm Ferdinand, um, whose wonderful book, Decolonial Ecology, Thinking from the Caribbean World, um, was translated into English in 2022. Um, it's also published in French. And Ferdinand is um, a thinker from, from the, the French Caribbean region, and he draws on this uh, Caribbean history and Caribbean philosophies uh, to develop a decolonial ecology. And he highlights the idea of counterplantation modes of life, that is maroon and Afro-Indigenous escape on the margins of the plantation system 
and the way in which it embodied a practice of alternative epistemologies, alternative ways of, of living, of farming, of connecting with nature. And arising out of a critique of the ecocidal and genocidal practices of the plantation system, which was a kind of proto-Anthropocene, we can instead turn to Afro-Caribbean culture making as a critique of the socio-ecological crisis that we now recognize as a so supposedly man-made planetary crisis. But as Sylvia Winter has shown us, we need to question what we mean by man and human, the human, who, and what would the human be um, after the sort of um, econ e economic kind of uh, plantation and capitalist actor that has led the world into this ecological crisis. So Ferdinand tries to overturn what he calls the double fracture of the white Anthropocene by foregrounding maroon ecologies, interspecies alliances, and what he calls the perspective from the hold of the slave ship. So the people who were not seen as human were actually developing the counter practices that we need. And I try to connect this in my own thinking about mobile commoning to a climate mobility justice perspective. And I have an article that's in, in press, it'll be out um, just after Christmas in Practica Teretisna, if I'm sorry, my Polish is not very good, um, on mobile commoning, reclaiming indigenous Caribbean, maroon and migrant commons. And here I delve into the history of the concept of commons and commoning as socially produced roles for sharing and moving together with others. I draw especially on the work of Silvia Federici. Neither private nor public commoning suggests a non-proprietary multi-species dwelling and moving that preserves livable futures. So I try to theorize the commons not just as like a shared resource or, or a, a shared place or territory or product, but as a radical way of moving together in the world, sharing spaces, refusing private property while recognizing our entanglements with others. And I believe that such practices of overlapping mobile commoning and concepts, um, which I'll get to in a moment, of mobility sovereignty can help us to envision transitions towards greater mobility justice in the face of what I described above, of the pandemic immobilities, the climate immobilities, the racialized borders and exclusions. So the concept of mobile commons has been used in several um, literatures. It appears in the migration literature um, in an analysis by Papadopoulos and Cianos of the migrant caravans. And they characterize mobile commons in migration. Um, and, and by the migrant caravans, it refers to the people who left, um, especially Honduras, but other parts of Central America, and they went in large collective groups, like the group of Haitians that I opened with, right, with thousands of people traveling together. And in that traveling together, they were drawing on, in this argument, several ways of commoning. There was the invisible knowledge of mobility. There was the infrastructure of connectivity in which they shared that knowledge across media, social media platforms, word of mouth. There's a multiplicity of informal economies of you know, how to survive on the move, including engaging with smugglers, um, how to get short-term work, how to locate resources. There were diverse forms of transnational communities of justice, such as solidarity groups, shelters, and NGOs that were assisting the migrant caravans. And there is a politics of care, providing support and building trust and you know, helping people along the way. So this is one way to think of mobile commoning in the world. So if you think about what I talked about, the counterplantation, the runaways who became maroons, who formed communities outside of the plantation system, compare this contemporary practice of migrant caravans as a kind of mobility resistance to the, the dominant uh, mobility regime. And then we can turn next to critical indigenous studies of mobile commoning. And critical indigenous studies have 
argued um, that colonial settler states were uh, violating the, the multiple multi-species mobilities that already existed within various places around the world where indigenous people lived and white settler states um, seized those commons. They violently cleared them, both for private property and for public state property. And they cut off practices of mobile commoning with fences, with barbed wire, with ecocide, genocide, and the removal of people. And in work on cross-border solidarity and migrant justice, Alicia Schmidt Camacho argues that indigenous people today are mobilizing against authoritarian and extractive regimes. They're creating plurinations, transnations, and using migration as a resistance against the nation state. So it's another interesting example. And then Carpio, Nachi, and Baraklov have proposed the concept of mobility sovereignty to, to think about the ability to choose when, where, how, and for what purposes we engage in movement. It refers equally to the right to move and the right to stay put. So across some of this critical indigenous scholarship, we see ways of people trying to enact mobility sovereignty and to assert indigenous understandings of place of more than human relations and of mutual responsibility. Um, and I'll just lead to two examples of um, the concept of transmotion has been developed by um, uh, Nishnabeg scholars, Gerald Visenor and Leanne Simpson. And they talk about transmotion as this kind of reciprocal relationship with nature that is neither monotheistic nor territorially sovereign. It suggests a multiplicity of transits and transmobilities. And the work by Michelle Lelievre on unsettling mobility draws on Mi'kmaq practices to also look at the need um, for theorizing mobility that considers not only how people move from one place to another, but the values associated with movements, the central perceptions experienced by moving subjects and the ways in which indigenous subjectivity um, has a different relationship to mobilities of humans and of non-humans in nature. So I wanna just get to the conclusion um, and this is, um, Thinking beyond climate colonialism, how to sum up, um, this is an image of what we, what we call Turtle Island, which is uh, North America, what it is, is called in many indigenous traditions here. And that, that's associated with stories about a great flood that covered the land and then how the people recovered. So any appropriate response to the contemporary climate emergency must appreciate its foundations in the history of violent coercive systems of plantation slavery and indigenous displacement and attempted genocide, in the present global uneven development premised on anti-Blackness and anti-Native ideologies and border regimes that shape human vulnerability, and in the futurity of resistance against these ideologies of exclusion that continue to influence who has access to resources, to safety, and to preferable or livable ecologies. Instead of reactive border closures and wall building, the global north should acknowledge climate debt, climate reparations, mobile commons, and mobility sovereignty. And this demands that we not only reduce the excessive fossil fueled mobilities of the kinetic elite, but also repair and prevent the injustices of differential and uneven mobilities, defend people's right to remain in place should they wish to, and stop the ongoing global resource extraction that leads to climate colonialism, even under green energy transition regimes. And finally, I'll conclude by saying that a climate mobility justice approach recognizes the coloniality, even of green energy transitions. Intersectional struggles must address legacies of settler colonialism, racial capitalism, et cetera. And it includes not just CO2, right? We also need to look at reparations around PCBs, PFAS, fluoride, radiation, and other um, ecologically damaging uh, elements that have been released into the world. This calls for a restorative justice approach. Rather than the exclusionary lockdown of borders, we should question our responsibility for reparations in a moral, legal, and financial framework under international law. 
the deadly corridors and detention camps and spaces of confinement at our borders are illegal, they're ineffective, and they're a dehumanizing response to the complex climate mobilities of the world today. And I call for a feminist, a decolonial, a critical Black and Indigenous analysis to develop and advocate for alternative frameworks for reparative and epistemic justice. And I will stop there and thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Scheller, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I, I, I started in the introduction, I talked mostly about cars because that's what we associate with mobility, but you, your presentation didn't even mention it. And it shows how important this is to, to expand how we think about mobility, right? And, you know, in, in terms of temporality, temporality and, and geography and, and so on. So I really, really appreciate um, your, your presentation. And now I, I would like to, to uh, give the chance for uh, our audience to, to uh, participate here in the conversation. So please, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or like your digital hand, virtual hand, or you can also write in the in the chat, uh, but it's better if you if you speak. Um, so while we wait, nobody um, has raised their hands yet. So while we wait for people to organize their thoughts, um, I'll pass the word on to Anke again, um, because I think she has um, uh, a question for Dr. Shiloh. Yes. Thank you for the interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. And what I find, yeah, what I'm thinking about, you were talking about the, um, how to say, the excessive consumption of energy and also of travel. And I'm always thinking of how can we downscale? And did you ever think about the relationship of your mobility justice concept and degrowth? And how could the just mobility discourse become also an effective entry point for the degrowth and post-growth as a political movement? Yeah, that's such a good question. And, and of course, I mean, it's funny when, um, when Bernardo was saying he opened with a reference to cars. And as you were saying that, I was thinking, oh, I don't think I've hardly touched upon cars in this talk. But of course, cars are fundamental to this question of how our economies work and how, um, if we want to think about degrowth, does it relate to changing all of the ways in which we move around? And what would it mean to relocalize economies? But then for me, there's a tension between some of the movements towards um, degrowth that are very locality centric and given the inequities of the world and the way the global economy is set up today, that could have harmful effects on other parts of the world, right? So there, there are some reasons to think that we still need a kind of relationality and an acknowledgement of our relations to other parts of the world. So can we do degrowth in a way that is still connected and honors our um, connections to other places and other people and appreciates other places and other people. Because sometimes I think degrowth can get, swing too much towards um, saying, you know, we're, we're just gonna turn inwards. We're gonna turn inwards into our own place and our um, dig deep into our kind of roots, our rootedness in place. But for a settler colonial world, that's not, easy. I mean, it's complicated, right? So here I am in North America. What what does it mean for me to, to say, oh, okay, I'm going to um, have a more local economy here uh, because this economy was built on displacement and, uh, you know, uh, still is violating um, the traditional uh, peoples and territories of, of, of this place. And so I think the degrowth conversation itself needs to be complicated with some um, decolonial and critical indigenous perspectives.
thank you, uh, Dr. Scheller. Um, Alexander, do we have anyone in the chat? Uh, no, yeah. Ah, here. So we have a question from um, from Dominic Bull. So Dominic, please. Yes, yes. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sadly, my camera is not working. I'm very sorry. Thank you so much um, for your presentation. Very, very interesting. I my question pertains to the to the difference, perhaps, also between the American and the. The German discourse in terms of uh, politicizing or repoliticizing, or per perhaps politicizing for the first time, the mobility discourse, um, especially in the sense that um, racism and structural racism is not such a such a common uh, point in the conversation in Germany as opposed to the United States. Uh, we don't have such a you know big uh, Black Lives Matter um, movement, for instance. So. If you if you have perhaps a comment uh, a comment or or a suggestion and an advice for the German um, discourse, how do we, you know, repoliticize the conversation and include all those topics hmm. which we in, in Germany are even more ignorant about than, for instance, um, you in the United States? Yeah. So, you know, because. Um, of being in the United States and and um, being, I, I was you know born in Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia, which is um, a kind of port city that faced out to the the wider Atlantic world. Um, I I always studied the the transatlantic world in the Caribbean as um, a connected zone, and so although a lot of discourse around say black lives matter is seen as like internal to the US and it's it's about you know this the nation state in a sense the forming of america for me the forming of america has always been part of this wider transnational oceanic community and i believe that for all of us wherever we are um it's possible to look at your context not just as a nation state and like what the internal um, debates are within, but to look at your wider uh, relations to the world. So certainly Germany has wider relations to other parts of the world. And Germany is not just enclosed in its territorial borders, right? And of course those borders have changed over time. And so in many ways, the debates in Germany are, are linked more to the you know, the histories of, of the borders of Germany and the German mm -hmm. state and the political implications of that. Um, and so, yes, it opens up to a different sets of issues, but I think in Germany, there's been a lot of consideration about um, uh, immigration and um, Turkish uh, German people and guest workers in the past have been, you know, questions. Um, the welcoming of different refugee groups, um, the Ukrainian refugees who have, are moving now, all of these like are different phases, different histories of debate that have happened. Um, and, and I think they relate to the same kinds of issues, okay? So they're not posed in exactly the same way. It's, it, but certainly Germany has a, um, a relationship to otherness and to histories of racism that are equally important for thinking in, in kind of ways that um, open our minds up to rethinking rootedness and belonging. Mm -hmm. And this idea of mobile commoning is a way to ask like, where, how do we make belonging together in the world without just claiming like, this is our place and we own this place place and it's ours and ours alone, right? Mobile commoning asks us to let that go a little bit and to think about how um, other people and, and nature, plants and animals can also um, have the capacities and the, and the recognition of their needs to move as well. So and that was kind of a roundabout answer to your question, but. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, Marina, yeah, please. Uh, um, hello, um, thank you for widening my understanding of solidarity for mobility. So far, I've only come across it uh, for food and energy, but it's so completely obvious. Um, and maybe I start with what I want to ask and then give some context if necessary. Um, like for data or energy, there is this trade net, there is this range of a, a, like a scale between solidarity and sovereignty. And solidarity, I associate with the comments because I use it in my PhD as well. But sovereignty obviously is about self-determination, etc. And I was wondering if you had thoughts how to bring it together. Um, yeah, and uh, recently at the ESS, we had a comments public partnership workshop and um, I will definitely advertise this talk there. And yeah, basically it's this range of terms that I was wondering. Yeah, thanks for that question. You know, it's it's funny that you ask that because it's it's exactly the point at which I've gotten to that I'm still um, trying to work out. Um, it's like you've pinpointed something that um, I came across that argument for mobility sovereignty in the work I cited by Carpio, um, Natchi and Baraclough, which is a special issue of the journal Mobilities, which is on um, indigenous mobilities. And so, you know, in, in um, indigenous movements, there's a claim, of course, for tribal sovereignty. And tribal sovereignty can, can mean what they call the rematriation of land, but mobility sovereignty, I thought was a really interesting suggestive idea that's a little bit different than territorial sovereignty. So mobility sovereignty is sort of like this idea, as you said, of your self-determination. Um, but when we contrast that with commoning, mobility, mobile commoning, as you said, a form of solidarity has a different, um, political meaning to it than sovereignty. So I do think in, in thinking forward about mo mobile commons and commoning, I do wanna think about what the idea of mobility sovereignty means for that. And what does it mean to recognize people's rights to mobility which, which and to self-determine their own movement. And, and the sovereignty concept is one way to think about that. But, um, I do think solidarity, I actually have not seen somebody use the term mobility solidarity. I've seen mobile commoning, mobility commoning, mobile commons, mobility sovereignty, but maybe mobility solidarity is another way that we need to think that through. Yeah, thank you um, for that. And maybe what could help you, there is a PhD study from 2018 of somebody who passed away this year, sadly, but he used modern commons. So the whole Elino Ostrom really did it so well for traffic systems. So. Maybe mm. there's a little bit relevant. Okay. I, I can yeah. I can give yeah, I can send it to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Verena. That was a very good question. Uh, um, Elias Koenig, uh, Justice Fellow at the Institute. Um, he has a question. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. And also sorry for being on the phone and not being able to turn on my camera. But I wanted to ask actually about uh, two things uh, in relation to what you talked about. The first thing is uh, sort of the idea of the climate migrants slash the, the term climate migration, because I just remembered reading um, a passage in Amitav Ghosh where he uh, interviews um, so-called Bangladeshi climate migrants in Italy and um, figures out that none of these people would themselves necessarily identify as climate migrants. And then in his own text sort of wonders, you know, if he's imposing that category on people. So I, I was wondering about this and then also the, the, the whole problematic sort of, of like climate determinism when usually, you know, the sort of crossing borders of people is linked to so many different factors. Um, so if you have any thoughts about that, and also maybe relatedly about the term climate apartheid, because I think climate and eco-apartheid has been used uh, more recently and sort of how that may also relate to your work on climate mobility justice. So yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I love um, 
Amitav Ghosh's The Nutmeg's Curse, which um, has a whole series of wonderful essays on some of these topics. And absolutely, the part of the thinking behind the term climate mobilities is also to pick apart that um, overemphasis on like one determinant of migration and to contextualize the fact that people um, have many intersectional reasons for moving or staying put and that they're relational. And also that that sometimes those, um, I mean, if you take Bangladesh in particular, there's actually been, there were studies also showing how a lot of people just moved very locally. So when there was flooding um, in Bangladesh, it's not that everybody left the country or something, it's that they moved to a different place and that they've always done that. I mean, that there's always been patterns of kind of moving when you needed to, and then coming back again. And, um, and so part of the critique of climate migration was that it missed all the nuances of the many ways in which people combine moving and staying and coming back in order to make their lives work. And sometimes it may just be that some family members move and help support other family members who stay and like that people move relationally. And so it gives many different ways to sort of think about what are the impacts of climate disruption going to be. Um, I mean, of course, this year we've seen the terrible flooding in Pakistan and the you know devastation of farmland there. And so many people um, were forced to move away from their land but most of those people will probably return to those places. It's they, they probably will not completely abandon them. Or if they do move, they might move to cities, right, within Pakistan. It's so the notion that that you know there will just be wholesale departure from certain countries is too simplistic to really get at the patterns that are happening. And climate. Uh, climate apartheid is also, I think, a great um, a concept that I I refer to in in some of this work as well. And um, for me, it's especially um, sort of poignant for um, Caribbean islands, where there have been. Um, I, I've written an essay recently on the containment of Haiti, and the way in which Haitians are constantly. Um, expelled from other countries or pushed back or denationalized, um, even if they've been born as if they're second or third generation. Um, for example, the Dominican Republic is um, expelling Haitians and sending them back. And it is partly this sense of, um, of a sort of containing people within a, a place that is not ecologically sustainable at the moment or politically or economically sustainable. And so climate apartheid um, does seem to reference the, the these places where people are are saying they want where they live to be protected and to be green and to go through a green transition and to to improve, um, but they're going to push other people out and just leave them abandon them. And then I think climate apartheid is one way to think about that. And certainly, it's extremely racialized in the world today in terms of what, as I called, like who will be able to be in survivable or preferable or livable ecologies and who will be pushed out. Um, great, thank you. Thank you, Elias. Thank you, Dr. Scheller. Um, I, um, ah, Dominic has another question. So I was going to ask a question, but I'll let him go. You can also go ahead, Bernardo. You can go first. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, Dr. Scheller, I was wondering may, to bring to like to the news because the, in the US where you were based, the, there was this uh, railroad strike that wasn't. And I think it does touch on so many interesting questions, right? Because it, the railroad in the US is mainly for transportation of goods. And specifically, I think these companies that were involved, they are not passenger trains they are there for uh goods and uh it does and it touches on the the financialization of of the u.s economy on labor rights but one aspect of this story that i've never 
uh, I've not heard much about in the cover coverage that I've seen is the climate justice aspect of it. But it is a story about mobility. So inevitably, there should be a climate uh, justice side to this story i don't know I, I don't have a specific question but i was just wondering how you mm -hmm. from from your perspective uh, uh how do you see this and what what broader uh, lessons of this specific story can we take from it what should we be aware of like those of us outside the us that that is not being covered in the media i don't know i was just wondering if you yeah. That's so interesting. Um, you know, there, there's a wave of um, unionization and un and strike actions that are sort of happening across North America now. And I don't know if this is true in, in Europe as well. And it, it's different, maybe different labor kinds of relations, but it's unusual here after decades of sort of the suppression of unions that there's a, a rising um, interest in unionization right now and, and labor movements. And um, the most powerful uh, labor negotiations and threat of strikes occur around logistics um, bottlenecks, right? Logistics hubs. So for example, ports, when ports have been blockaded, but railroads as well. It's like a it's like a realization as unionization is kind of picking up favor again that wow, stopping the railroads is a very powerful action to take. Now the US, like you said, is completely different than Europe in that we have um very weak passenger rail systems or very fragmented passenger rail systems and Amtrak, um, it, it only operates by um, using the freight rail system of tracks. So the country has a, a very strong freight rail system and it's not just the, it's the movement of goods, it's also the transport of hydrocarbons. So oil fuel, um, and hydrocarbons are transported by rail in tankers. So it's part of our fossil fuel infrastructure is partly why the railroads are so in strong, why, why they um, are invested in, why they're um, as large as they are. And so the strike in a way is a strike at the heart of the fossil fuel infrastructure system. And in that way, it's very threatening to corporate America um, or to the whole functioning of our entire system, which is why it's so unusual that the national government stepped in and that Biden asked Congress to end the strike. Um, and on the flip side of that, from a labor point of view, the, the, what they were striking over had to do with these conditions of work. And this is something we saw around um, what were called essential workers during the pandemic is that they, they were demanded to still be at work, to still come to work, to not take sick leave. Um, and, and in this rail system in particular, they were so um, like uh, scheduled in a way that they couldn't, couldn't take off time at all. And that's what they were fighting against. So again, it does come back to that pandemic inequalities that were laid bare of who was made to continue working and that they didn't have self-determination, not just of their mobility, but of their um, relation to their own labor. Uh, thank you. Thank you um, for that. Um, we have more questions. Uh, Dominic, do you mind if I go to Johanna because she hasn't asked yet? And then uh, yes, sure, 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 okay. sure. Yeah. And we'll get back to you. Okay, yeah. so Johanna, please. Um, Uh, Johanna, are you there? I think she I cannot am. speak. I ah. posted it in ah. the chat because I'm in the library. <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, okay. Okay, so it's a question about ah, yeah. um, the direction of transport and mobility transitions, saying, from what I perceive the most progressive advocates for a mobility transition in Germany can come up with is human-centered transport and mobility systems as opposed to car-centric, which is far from a relational understanding of mobility justice, mobile commoning, multi-species, yeah. Um, 
but it's also tricky to come up with methods that allow for assessing mobility justice from a more than human perspective, for instance, or approaching a decisively cosmopolitical stance in Stenger's understanding for mobility transition. Do I have any thoughts on that? Ooh, that's a that's a really great question. Yeah, I mean, to come back to that question about like transportation and, and energy transitions, it is so um, limited in a sense, constrained by our, um, our policy agendas, right? It's like, okay, well, we can do something that relates to public transit, or we can do something that improves pedestrian and bike infrastructure, or maybe with energy transitions, like our policy thinking is very limited to the, the sort of um, the usual avenues that we, that we think through. Um, can we subsidize, you know, renewable energy, and and it's very, it is very hard within that kind of. I guess you would call that a very. It's like a pragmatic politics of like, well, what can we get done? And we've almost reduced all of our politics to that pragmatic level. It's like, okay, well, we know there's um, there's differences politically, but here's like the one narrow thing that we can agree on, <laughs> um, and. Certainly, that does prevent us from taking a wider um, view of, a, of, of, as you say, of a more than human perspective, um, the bigger underlying issues, the multi species mobility. Um, and so, in some ways, that ki the kind of thinking I'm calling for could be seen as utopian. It's maybe it's utopian, but um, utopian in the in the good sense of can we try to or at least articulate what our values are and can we try to create examples of things that we think would be best and some of that work is done by social movements by um, community organizations by you know smaller scale people coming together and experimenting with things so a lot of what you might see as like concrete examples of mobile commoning or multi-species mobility justice are things that are happening in little ways in many different places. So I wouldn't I wouldn't want to give up on that politics. It's a different politics, I guess, than the sort of concrete policy making. And maybe someday well, there, there'll be ways for these social movements to sort of exert pressure on and influence um, the kind of policy debates that are happening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seller. Thank you, Johanna, for the great question. Um, Beno Flav Flatbad is also a Justice a Fellow at the Institute. Uh, he has a question. Yeah, um, thank, thank you, um, Dr. Scheller, for, for this really fascinating talk. This was really impressive also to see the all the different facets of the um, of, of mobility and re in relation to justice and to um, issues of coloniality to climate coloniality. This was really fascinating. So learned learned a lot and really impressive. Um, um, my question basically goes um, into the direction of the concept of mobility um, sovereignty. I think that was right as you call it. Um, when you when I listened to you, I, I was also thinking of the concept of migrate with dignity. That was um, a slogan, political slogan that was um, that was coined by the former president of Kiribati um, in Oceania. Um, this this concept of um, this sort of um, is directed against the victimization of climate migrants. And um, also to 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 get chance to um, for for better protection also within environmental law or international law. Um, my question would be: in, in how far does your idea of mobile, mobility sovereignty relate to to this idea of migrate with dignity? So, and how far do you do you see differences? Because um, I think that this this idea of dignity is also very powerful in terms of international law. And this also connects to the to the next question I have with that. And how far do you see um, and how far do you see a relationship of this idea of mobility sovereignty? And how far is it compatible also with international law? So, um, because particularly with the idea of dignity, I see this compatibil compatibility. But with sovereignty, um, I, I cannot really imagine how this could work. And if it's also an aim. To, to be compatible with international law. So this, this would basically be my question. And thanks again for, for the wonderful talk. 
Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I really like that connection to um, the Kiribati um, uh, argument for migrate with dignity. And I think you're right. Dignity is a really important um, value protected within international humanitarian law. And so is a good um, anchor point for making arguments, uh, like you're saying, for protecting people's it's sort of a, it's like a right to self-determination, but a right to self-determination of one's mobility or, or non-mobility. And when I, it's it's funny when you were talking, I was thinking about, for some reason I was, I'm still thinking about cars and transportation. And there, we just had reports in the US about like the number of um, people who've been killed by, by cars um, has, car drivers and car, you know, car crashes, pedestrians and bicyclists, we have these soaring rates of, um, of death happening. And it's in, in, during the pandemic, it increased by a huge amount. And you think about the dignity of the pedestrian, the dignity of the cyclist, like we have a, a, a right to be able to walk on a street or bike ride on a street and not be mowed down by a car and yet we're seeing more and more people killed this way. And it's like that, it's the, the shock of the indignity of it, I think. It's the shock of seeing people killed all the time in these like merciless ways and that we accept that as a society. And the same goes for migrants. When we see people drowning in these boats and we see people um, in the deserts with where they're not, you know, they're forced to kind of sneak across these very dangerous places. Why? Because we don't give them the dignity to arrive at a port of entry and say, I need help, or I, you know, I want to make an asylum claim, I want to try to be here, or I want to rejoin my family members. It's that indignity in both of those instances that is so um, uh, important that we keep uh, attention on and that we remind ourselves like of our own um, failure if we accept that, right? Like we should not accept that happening. And so, yeah, I think that's a, a really great point. And I think that's the kind of point that many of the, the small island states have tried to make as well, right? Is that like, you, you, we can't just either like wish them out of existence almost and just think they're just gonna go away. Like that, that oh well, sea levels will rise and they'll they'll just have to move and deal with it. Like, it's just not the right way um, to think about that. So um, going back to that term sovereignty, yeah, I still, I still will just have to think through whether the term sovereignty is helpful in making those kinds of arguments and I'm not sure yet. Great, thank you. Thank you, Beno. Thank you, Dr. Scheller. Dominic, now, if you want to come back uh, to ask the question that you were going to. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me another chance. Um, it's, I, I don't really know how to, how to ask this question. It's more, uh, it's more a thought and then maybe uh, I'm curious to hear what you, how you relate to this. Um, it's about the notion of loss that I also hear now in your in your answer to to, to Benno's question. That there is a, a sense of loss, as in the loss that is imposed on um, on, on on people who have to leave uh, their land because of system breakdown of sorts. Uh, and then there is the kind of loss that countries would have to engage in. For the first loss to kind of not happen, if that makes sense. Um, so there's like these 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 double dimensionality to 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 loss. Um, and I, I I don't know. It's there, there is this very um, kind of strange finding that I that I read recently in a paper by Rebecca Elliott uh, called the the sociology of climate change as the sociology of loss, where she makes the point that in the community. Um, Kind of unites around the loss that they are facing. For instance, there was a study in Louisiana with a, a, a community living close to the seaside. They had to move out of sea level because of sea level rise, and they moved preemptively. So they they sat around 
the community center and said, let's move preemptively um, and not wait until the next uh, flood is coming. And that this kind of uh, engagement to, to lose intentionally or, or preemptively led to, a, to, a, to an emergence of a new solidarity within that community. Mm. Um, kind of an intentional community out of the, the, the situation of, of scarcity, of existential threat. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's. There, there, there's a contradictions in my mind on this because on the one hand we see all this loss that you also had in your presentation. Uh, is there any way of, you know, how, how does that loss and the solidarity, how does that work together? I don't know. Maybe you have some, maybe you have some reaction. Sorry, it's not a very precise uh, yeah. question. But... No, I love that. Um, you know, it makes me think about how. Okay, we focus so much attention on. The, the least um, powerful, the, the sort of most vulnerable and the things they're going to have to do, right? They're, they're going to lose, they're going to have to move, they're going to be displaced, whatever, um, or they're going to die. And yet it's the powerful or the more privileged who, if we preemptively kind of took some losses and maybe tried to live uh, in a, as I say, in a in a less um, energy consuming way, that maybe it would it would also bring us, like you say, intentional community, and maybe mobile commoning is a way of thinking what we me- need to move towards. Those of us who can, those of us who have the privilege, the ability, the capacity, the resources, we have um, the choice now before us to maybe try to intentionally build mobile commoning, meaning that we share and limit our own use of resources. And that we, by collectively sharing with each other more, we would have less of an ecological impact on the world. We would reduce our greenhouse gases. We would reduce our energy consumption. And that we need to be thinking along those lines rather than simply that we're all going to keep living the way we live, but we're just going to do it with green energy. Yeah. And that's what we've been reduced to arguing about. Like, okay, how are we going to make the green energy transition? How are we going to build the new infrastructure rather than really thinking through if we give up some of how we are thinking and living now, what could we make that would be even better? Yeah. And I guess that relates back to degrowth as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, uh, ah, Anka has one question. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think it kind of very well uh, closes the circle, maybe a little bit also what you were talking about, because probably you are also aware of the works by Matthew Patterson and then how the um, structures have been inscribed in institutions and in uh, yeah, infrastructures and in the individuals themselves. And yeah, I mean, it's like, it's a wrong wording, but how optimistic and how realistic is it that we actually can manage like a um, transport or yeah, um, mobility transition in the near future that is socially just and not kind of reproduces the current negative um, lines we are having, you know, what I'm thinking of, like, I think sometimes I'm very unpatient <laughs> in the <laughs> whole transformation process. And I don't, yeah, sometimes I need a little bit more of a concrete, yeah, I don't yeah. know, maybe it's just it's too slow for me, the change. <laughs> yeah, well, it always is. I mean, but um, I have, I mean, I started arguing um, a while ago that, that we wouldn't, we would not we will not get a sustainable mobility transition if we do not address the social justice issues because you can't have one without the other. We cannot have a green, low carbon, sustainable economy without social justice because there will always be the groups who are consuming more, who are still doing things with fossil fuel, who are still, I mean, are, are, are economy is still building out new fossil fuel infrastructure all the time. And it, and it's often the people fighting from a social justice perspective 
that are the ones trying to stop that, that are the ones who are most harmed by that, who are, so it's like the, the social justice struggles are the ones that will help make the sustainable energy uh, transition possible, the mobility transition possible. So we, we really need to do them together. And it, maybe it will take time, but <laughs> we may as well be doing things in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you, Anka. Is there any last question? We are approaching the end of the of the lecture, but I think that um, nobody's raising their hands. I think that's a great note to end on, on a somewhat optimistic note, but also a, a kind of call to action that, you know, you actually have to mobilize, organize, and 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 do the struggle. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, change is not coming. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you have uh, last words, uh, last thoughts. Yeah, uh, and just thank you for that. And just one last thought on that point is that I mean I think sometimes some of us who are academics feel like okay, we're we're not on the front lines of, you know, activist organizing, whatever, or maybe some of us are, but it's still, it's important to do the academic work as well, like the, the, the intellectual work that goes into um, learning the histories, thinking about the connections, understanding how worlds are made and how they're working. All of that is important too. And I think sometimes we we in, in recent years like that gets forgotten and like it's sort of like there's a rush to the to the barricades and like that we all have to be out there um that's important but i i think the way we think and this question of epistemic justice of now how do we construct knowledge what do we do in universities what are we doing as students as teachers as professors that's all important as well um, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Scheller, for this uh, uh, wonderful and thought-provoking presentation. Thank you for all of you who joined us. Thank you for Anka for, for the questions. Um, this this um, was a great contribution to our ongoing conversation about justice and sustainability. So we are very thankful to uh, for you, Dr. Scheller, for having joined us. Um, so Please look on our website for information on how to sign up to our, and subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Twitter to receive news and on our activities. Uh, this was the last Justice Lecture of the year. We thank all of you who have joined us throughout the year. We wish you all a meaningful and joyful holiday season in which we foster love and connection, but also critical thinking and reflection about the world we live in. And we look forward to seeing you all next year and continue the conversation about justice and sustainability. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Scheller. Thank you all. It's been wonderful to be with you. Thanks for your questions. <laughs>